Today we'll dive into the intricate assembly of the BMW R60-5 Final Drive. As you might know, the Final Drive is a crucial part of a motorcycle's power delivery system, transferring torque from the gearbox to the rear wheel. Now in this video, we'll have a good look at all necessary components, ranging from brand new parts to also used parts which we can reuse, identify which parts need to be replaced, and then later on we can focus on the full assembly process. So let's get right to it. Everything that you can see on this table is needed for a full rebuild, especially brand new parts like the ones down below in this left corner. So we have four brand new bearings, two for each shaft, two are for the pinion gear, which is also the shaft portion of the gear. And then over here we have two bearings for the ring gear, which is also the shaft portion of the gear. Now up above we have three oil seals, which will keep the oil within the final drive. We have a brand new breather, which will be installed into the housing a gasket which goes between the final drive cover and the housing, and then one more gasket which goes actually between the final drive and the swing arm. This is on the table because it also belongs to this assembly. Now with the brand new bearings and seals out of the way, I'm left with used parts on this table. We're gonna have a good look at these used parts, especially the ring and the pinion gear, because these two components have some serious wear on them, and I really wanna replace this, but before I do, I just wanna show you guys a prime example of why you should replace your gears, especially if they look like the ones that I have in front of me. On the left side, you'll find the pinion gear, and on the right side, the ring gear is situated. These two components mesh within the final drive housing, forming a configuration similar to this. To clarify, the pinion gear serves as the driving gear in this rotational mechanism, while the ring gear follows behind it. When rotated counterclockwise, the ring gear will subsequently move. While wear and tear are expected over 50 years, this set of gears displays significant damage. Originally, both gears were induction hardened at the factory. However, upon closer inspection, it's evident that the hardening surface surface has worn through with the hard material chipping away to reveal the softer material beneath. Every tooth shows signs of chipping with one particular tooth showing the most severe damage. Continued rotation of the pinion gear could lead to catastrophic failure of the final drive assembly. Hence, it's important to replace gears with such extensive damage. Turning our attention to the ring gear, we'll observe a similar pattern although with slightly better durability due to its higher tooth count compared to the pinion gear. The gear ratio in front of me is 37 to 11, which translates to a ratio of 3.36, with 11 teeth on the pinion gear and 37 on the ring gear. The distribution of load is more evenly spread across the ring gear, contributing to its relatively better condition. Upon closer inspection, the ring gear is just beginning to wear through its hardening surface. Unfortunately, this set is beyond repair, particularly the heavily worn output shaft which drives the rear wheel. Fortunately, I managed to source a new old stock ring and pinion gear set with the same ratio of 37 to 11, and the ring gear is already welded to the output shaft. Comparing a brand new output shaft spline to the used one reveals over 50% of wear, a considerable amount given the motorcycle's odometer reading of 90,000 miles. If your gear set is in good condition, but the output shaft spline is worn, you can opt for a replacement part that welds onto the ring gear. This process involves cutting off the old ring gear weld, removing the ring gear, pressing it onto the new shaft, and then welding it back into place. However, since I'll be replacing the entire assembly, this procedure won't be covered in today's video, but maybe in a future video. To kick off this assembly, I'll focus on the pinion gear and its corresponding components. The first part I want to install will be the outer race of the needle bearing, which actually supports the front of this pinion gear. Now this needle bearing will have to be installed into the final drive housing, and to do that, I'm going to make a small modification and then start assembling the rest. Starting with the installation process, the pinion gear will be placed into the final drive housing from the left side. Upon entering the housing, noticeable play between the pinion and the housing becomes evident. The play is attributed to the absence of a needle bearing that should be supporting the front shaft in this specific location. The outer ring of the needle bearing centers the pinion shaft to the final drive housing. On the other hand, the inner race of the bearing will be pressed onto the pinion shaft. More on this later. The needle bearing, also known as the needle roller bearing, is designed to handle high constant radial load from the pinion gear. A distinct groove can be observed on the outer race of this bearing. It's crucial to insert the bearing in one specific direction, with the groove facing to the right, as it's off-center aligning it with the safety pin. Within the small bore, a pin acts as a safety feature for the outer ring of the bearing within the final drive housing. The original grooved dowel pin was extracted from the housing 
and it will be replaced with a custom-made pin from an M4 bolt. The bolt's shank has been turned down to 3.2mm, leaving 4mm of thread towards the top and cut to a length of 35mm with a narrow slot for a flat screwdriver. To install this pin, a thread must be created towards the top of the housing. A 3.3mm drill bit and a hand crank will be utilized to open up the bore, but only for the first 5mm, followed by inserting an M4 by 0.7 tap and cutting threads to a depth of roughly 5mm. Cutting oil was not used due to the minimal number of threads to be cut, simplifying the cleanup. Here you can see me test fitting the threaded pin. Not only do I want it to sit flush with the final drive housing, but I want the bottom portion of the threads to tighten with the cut thread in the housing. This will act as a locking mechanism. On top of that, it's advised to check that the pin is sticking out into the bore, essentially acting as a safety pin for the outer ring of the needle bearing. Here are three still pictures for reference. Now that we have addressed that issue, we can proceed to install the needle bearing. For this task, I'll utilize a bearing driver fitted with a 20mm and 31mm disc. Before installing, I'll heat the housing to approximately 70 degrees Celsius using a heat gun. This will expand the housing, facilitating the bearing installation process. After a few seconds, the bearing will be properly seated and it will be time to insert the safety pin. To ensure added security, I'll apply medium strength Loctite to the thread. Once fully inserted, I'll pin the metal near the flat to firmly secure the threaded pin. The completed installation will resemble this. With the final drive housing still retaining some warmth, we can proceed to add three additional components. We'll begin by installing the small ring gear seal, followed by the ring gear thrust bearing, and lastly the rear axle bushing. To accomplish this task, I've brought the assembly to the arbor press ensuring the components are driven straight into the housing. Using a seal and bearing driver, I'll precisely install the single lip seal. Next, the thrust bearing will be carefully pressed into place, ensuring the inner race faces upwards during installation. Now let's move on to installing the rear axle bushing. Though it doesn't hold oil, I'll apply some flange sealant for a better seal. The axle bushing will be pressed into the housing, ensuring it's fully seated. Excuse me for this out of focus camera angle. Once installed, it should look like this. While we're at the arbor press, we can proceed to press the inner race of the thrust bearing onto the shaft portion of the ring gear. Ensure that the lip is facing downwards and press it onto the shaft until it reaches the shoulder. To accomplish this, I'm utilizing an old tapered bearing race and a flat disc. The outcome should look like this. This assembly step enables us to test fit the new pinion shaft and verify our pinion depth. I have all required components for this task laid out on the table. To begin, I'll attach a custom undersized bearing to the pinion shaft. Indeed, this double angular bearing has a larger inner diameter and a smaller outer diameter. This design allows me to easily slide the bearing onto the shaft without the need for pressing it on. The pinion shim lies in front of the bearing and the only way to replace or exchange it is to heat the housing and extract it. And I do not want to necessarily heat the housing with a brand new bearing in place. Now with that said, we can install the washer followed by the tapered shim. The larger diameter faces the washer and the smaller diameter faces the bevel drive coupling. And we can put that on as well, making sure the machined surface faces downwards and the gear upwards. On top of this, we'll place the locking washer and then thread on the nut. To proceed with the installation, I opted for a slightly thicker pinion shim for the initial setup. Since I lack a variety of pinion shims in different sizes, I pre-calculated the potential shims required to set up the gears. The pinion and ring gears are factory machined and matched, necessitating a test of the contact pattern to achieve the correct setup. This process entails using various shims to visually identify the meshing of gears. Instead of investing in numerous costly shims, I opted to order one thicker one than necessary. This allows me to gradually remove material from it to achieve the desired thickness as needed. 
For now, I'll install the pinion shim into the housing, ensuring it's seated against the face. The pinion assembly can then be installed, ensuring it goes in perfectly horizontal and also into the needle bearing. Next, the threaded ring will be installed with the four slots facing outwards. Once in place, verify that the pinion turns freely without any issues. Following this, we can select our ring gear thrust shim made of bronze. It's advisable to choose one slightly larger than initially required, as you can always remove material if needed. If your shim is too thin, you'll need to replace it with a thicker one, which you might not have. Once placed on the ring gear, we can install it and carefully press it down into the housing. Upon installation, it's important to understand the clearances you are working with. From what I can feel and hear, this setup seems to be too loose, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. If we were too tight, I would require a thicker shim so we can still work this out. Now that I've removed the ring gear and confirmed that the gears are close within the assembly, I'll utilize gear marking compound to aid in visually referencing the meshing of teeth. The gear marking compound will be applied to 5 or 6 teeth on both the drive and coast sides. Don't worry too much about the pattern at this stage, we're just testing the initial setup and determining our next steps. As this video progresses, I'll delve into more detail and break down the terminology for you. Once fully seated on the thrust bearing, we'll rotate the pinion clockwise at least three and a half times to complete a full rotation of the ring gear, hence the 3.36 gear ratio. The pattern we're creating on the ring gear will appear on the drive side of the tooth. On these teeth, you can observe the contact area where the pinion was in contact with the ring gear. The highlighted area within the gear marking compound comes close to the face of the teeth. This represents the top surface of the ring gear teeth. Now let's examine the pinion gear more closely. Applying a moderate amount of gear marking compound will make it easier to identify the pattern on the first few teeth. However, the contact pattern on the pinion gear is most prominent near the head and the first third of the face. Our objective is to ensure the teeth mesh as closely as possible at their centers. This promotes gear longevity by reducing load and preserving tooth health over time. Pinion depth is indicated by the position of the pattern between the face and the flank of the ring gear teeth. Please make sure to remember this as it's the most crucial advice I can offer for adjusting the pinion depth. If the contact pattern is too close to the face of the ring gear, adjust the pinion inward by using a thinner shim or removing material from the pinion shim. Conversely, if the pattern is too close to the flank of the ring gear, increase the thickness of the pinion shim. As previously mentioned, this pattern is clearly visible on both the ring gear and the pinion gear, so it's crucial to understand the contact pattern you're observing. Now that I've discovered the pinion gear needs adjustment inward, I'll remove the pinion assembly from the final drive housing to access the pinion shim. To modify the steel pinion shim, I'll utilize a small glass sheet, a sheet of 220 grit sandpaper, securing the sandpaper to the glass with some tape. Next, I'll measure the shim's thickness using an outside micrometer at five points to assess its parallelism. Using a machine sleeve as a weight, I'll polish the pinion shim's surface. The pinion shim will be held onto the sleeve with some tape. During this process, I'll allow the sleeve to provide weight while guiding the assembly over the sandpaper, ensuring the shim remains parallel. After material removal, I'll wipe off the shim, verify the new size, and document it. The assembly can now be reassembled with new gear marking compound to assess the contact pattern. From the latest tests, it's evident that the contact pattern on the ring gear has shifted away from the face, indicating a positive adjustment. The drive side shows a good contact pattern and there's also a nearly centered pattern on the coast side of the teeth. Ideally, we aim for the contact pattern to be centralized on the ring gear teeth. However, the pinion gear's contact pattern has shifted from the first third of the drive face to the middle, indicating correct adjustment. While the pattern on the face interacting with the coast side of the ring gear is slightly off center, it's acceptable given the perfectly centered drive side. It's important to note that this adjustment was achieved solely by modifying the pinion shim. Now that I'm pleased with the pinion depth and this was set with the test bearing, it's time to secure the pinion bearing into the housing with a brand new double angular bearing. Once again, I'm at the Arbor Press ready to install the bearing with the press fit. The shaft and bearing will be lightly coated with assembly lube for easier assembly. The bearing must be fully seated against the pinion shaft's shoulder. Next, I'll apply some assembly lube to the bearing, even though it has light grease in it, followed by the washer and the tapered shim.
After that, the beveled drive coupling is placed on the spline followed by the lock washer. To hold this assembly together, I will tighten the nut with help of a custom coupling tool. This tool will hold the drive coupling as I torque the pinion nut. Once tight, I will place it in a Ziploc bag and put it in a freezer overnight. In the meantime, I'll get the rest of the components ready for assembly. The first tool is a heat shield to prevent the newly installed roller bearing from getting damaged due to heat. I will check the current final drive temperature and it reads 17 degrees Celsius. Now we have to heat the housing up for a few minutes to reach the desired temperature and install the pinion shaft as quickly as possible, making sure it goes in perfectly horizontal into the housing and into the front needle bearing. After this, quickly assemble the nut and torque it to spec. Once fully torqued, allow the final drive housing to reach room temperature. While the final drive housing is cooling down to reach room temperature, we can shift our focus to the ring gear and install the brand new deep groove ball bearing. This bearing will support the ring gear towards the final drive cover. We will simply place it on the shaft and use old bearing races as a pressing tool. The force should only be applied to the inner race of the ball bearing in order to keep it intact. Once fully seated, be sure to feel the bearing before continuing with the assembly. The housing has reached room temperature and we can install the ring gear. We know the pinion gear is fully seated with a brand new bearing and we can solely focus on the backlash. To do this, we'll install a custom 3D printed bearing tool to act as a retainer. This tool fits snug around the ball bearing and it locates within the final drive housing thanks to a few tabs, making the backlash reading more accurate. Here you can hear how much backlash we have to begin with, but now we also have to measure it. On this table, I have a few tools that will assist me in doing this. A dial gauge that reads up to one thousandths of an inch, a swivel clamp, a custom rod with an M8 by 125 thread, an aluminum block roughly 70 millimeters long, and the custom drive coupler tool. First, I'll thread the rod onto a desired stud on the final drive housing. I'll then attach the aluminum block to the ring gear and tighten it from the inside with a small bolt. I will then adjust the dial gauge so that it's perpendicular to the aluminum block. In order to have an accurate reading, the pinion gear must be held, and it's not allowed to move whatsoever. I will mount the drive coupler tool to the final drive and tighten it. I will set the dial indicator to zero and move the ring gear back and forth. From what I can read, the backlash between both pinion gear teeth and ring gear teeth is currently 15 thousandths of an inch. According to the specifications, this should be set within 6 to 8 thousandths of an inch. At the moment, we have too much backlash, which means the ring gear shim is too thick. Just to be sure the pinion gear is not moving, I will add a dot with a marker. This way I can see if it moves while I check the backlash. If it doesn't, it's good. If it moves, you'll have to find a better way to secure the pinion. To minimize backlash, I'll shave material off the ring gear shim. Once more, I'll use sandpaper to shave it down, but this time I'll be using 600 grit. A 33 or 34 millimeter socket is ideal for applying pressure to the shim. Here's a quick look at the shim after a few strokes. The factory surface from the shim wasn't even, showing visible tooling marks. I found that quite intriguing and just wanted to point that out. But don't worry, we'll flatten it out and adjust it to the correct thickness. After wiping it down with a rag, measuring the shim will reveal its parallelism. If everything checks out, reinstall the shim and assess the backlash. You may need to repeat this process until it falls within specifications, so it might take you a few tries. Taking small gradual steps is preferable when removing material from a shim. Now that everything's set up again, check the backlash. If it meets specifications, you're good to go. I'd also suggest checking the backlash 120 degrees apart from the original position to understand the full range. Since these gears are machined and matched at the factory, not every tooth engages exactly the same. With the correct pinion depth and backlash settings, I will reevaluate the contact pattern to assess the outcome. When rotating the pinion clockwise, it engages the drive side of the gear teeth, while counterclockwise rotation engages the coast side. Both patterns are crucial, but particular attention should be paid to the drive side pattern. After a few rotations, the pattern becomes visible towards the center of the drive side of the ring gear. The contact area then extends outward to the heel of the ring gear, 
where it encounters the next tooth of the pinion gear. This contact area is positioned sufficiently away from the tooth face and isn't too deep, preventing contact with the flank. It's essential to note that the housing alignment and pinion bore alignment can influence the pattern from heel to toe and may require machining to correct. In certain scenarios, achieving an ideal heel to toe pattern may be challenging, even with backlash within specifications and with the pinion at the appropriate depth. In this instance, the achieved pattern appears satisfactory and I'm pleased with the results. Here's a screen to assist with ring and pinion gear contact patterns. Stop the video if you wish. Before proceeding to close the final drive with seals and the cover, it's a good idea to install the final drive breather. This breather positioned on top of the final drive enables pressure equalization between the final drive and the external atmosphere. Failure to have this breather or if it becomes clogged could cause the shaft seals to leak making it essential to address during final drive rebuilding. This new breather represents a stainless steel upgrade over the older two-part design maintaining identical fitment. Prior to installation, I recommend measuring the bore to ensure a precise fit. While it remains a press fit, if the new part is oversized, it may be difficult during installation. Before installation, warm the housing area to 70 degrees Celsius and chill the breather in the freezer. Upon installing, gently tap it with a wooden block and a hammer until it seats firmly. You should be able to hear when it's fully seated. The breather should protrude approximately 12 millimeters once correctly installed. While the final drive housing is cooling down, I'll remove the pinion nut, bevel drive coupling, and the threaded ring. Inside the threaded ring will fit a brand new shaft seal which seals against the drive coupling. The reason for installing it now was to avoid any interference with the backlash measurement beforehand. It's crucial to install the shaft seal correctly, facing downwards, ensuring it doesn't touch the tapered shim. Another reason for this orientation is the seal's directional rotation as indicated here. Using an appropriate disc on the arbor press, press the seal all the way in, ensuring it seats against the shoulder. Before reinstalling, apply a generous amount of assembly lube to the shaft seal. Apply a thin layer of anaerobic sealant to the final drive thread, preventing oil leakage from the swing arm into the final drive. Hand thread the ring and torque it to specifications, slightly above the average value due to the applied sealant. Proceed by installing the bevel coupling, followed by the locking washer and nut. Applying medium strength Loctite for added security. After torquing to specification, using the custom tool, bend a portion of the locking washer as an additional safety measure around the pinion nut. Now it's time to remove the gear marking compound using brake cleaner before completing the final drive assembly. Select a lint-free cloth to avoid introducing contaminants into the final drive. Apply an adequate amount of assembly lube to the seals, bearings, and gear teeth. Once you've positioned the ring gear, it will likely be the last time you'll handle these gears for quite a while. Now we'll proceed to the final step which involves determining the ring gear bearing height to accommodate a shim. This cover will seal the final drive and a new shaft seal will be pressed into it. On the left we also have a new final drive gasket. To secure the cover to the final drive, we have 10 freshly plated cadmium nuts along with wave washers. While this cover keeps the ring gear bearing in position, ensuring its centering within the housing, it also establishes the correct end plate for the shaft. For this purpose, we'll need to insert a shim between the cover and the outer race of the ring gear bearing. When examining the cover from the rear, you'll notice that the gasket can only be positioned in one manner, due to the bore for the rear brake linkage. The larger step within this cover secures the bearing in place, while the smaller step accommodates the shaft seal. The seal should be inserted with the lip facing inward. The shim is placed on the same step as the bearing and is positioned accordingly. Ultimately, the shim will rest on the bearing as demonstrated. It's crucial to have the correct shim to prevent premature wear on the thrust bearing. Excessive pressure on the thrust bearing can quickly wear down the shim, leading to accelerated gear wear. With the appropriate shim cover, the gear should mesh correctly without any issues. To determine the shim's thickness, we'll measure the depth of cover 
and the depth from the housing to the bearing. Subtracting these values will yield the required shim thickness. We'll begin by using two blocks of equal height placed on the gasket surface of the final drive cover. These happen to be one, two, three blocks. To span a flat piece of metal across them, I'll use a steel ruler, ensuring it's vertical to avoid any bending discrepancies that could affect measurements. For depth measurement, I'll utilize a depth gauge accurate to the hundredths of a millimeter. From this measurement, subtract the total height added. In my setup, the height is exactly 3 inches or 76.2 millimeters. The total depth is 88.1 millimeters, indicating the case depth of 11.9 millimeters. Make sure to record this value. Now when it comes time to measure the ring gear bearing, there are various methods to do so. I'll demonstrate the method I use, but alternative approaches exist. To begin, I'll position a 123 block on the far side of the final drive housing, providing support for the metal ruler. The ruler will rest against the edge of the final drive and the 123 block, ensuring it remains perfectly vertical. This top surface will serve as the base for the depth gauge. The initial measurement will be taken from the ruler to the gasket surface, and then from the ruler to the outer race of the bearing. Subtracting these two values will yield a number smaller than the cover depth. In my case, this measurement comes to 11.29 millimeters. Subtracting the cover depth from the housing to bearing depth, I have 0.61 millimeters remaining. Fortunately, I have a shim that can be utilized. Had the value been smaller, I might have needed to stack two smaller shims to achieve the desired thickness. Before installing the shim, I'll ensure there are no burrs along the edges and that it's not bent. I'll remove the 3D printed gear centering tool and apply tape to the ring gear spline. A backward lap and a forward lap around ensure the tape doesn't adhere, protecting the seal during cover installation. Next, I'll carefully install the seal into the cover ensuring it sits approximately 1mm past the cover shoulder. Applying aircraft gasket sealant to the housing, I'll place the gasket in position and add another thin layer of sealant. Generously applying assembly loop to the bearing, I'll begin heating up the cover to roughly 70 degrees Celsius. Once heated, I'll place the cover onto the final drive, press it down by hand, and swiftly tighten the nuts to the correct torque. With the final drive housing gears now fully secured and sealed, it's time to install the two drain plugs and two filler plugs. The drain plugs can be torqued, one for the bevel coupler oil and the other for the final drive oil. While the filler caps can be threaded in, it's advisable to wait to torque them down until they have been filled.
With all these tasks completed, the final drive assembly is finished. I'll fill the final drive with heavyweight oil, typically 75W90, and then proceed with the initial ride. Within the first 100 kilometers, it's recommended to make two stops to verify the final drive's operating temperature, ensuring everything is functioning correctly. After this initial period, it should be suitable for many more kilometers of operation. If you made it this far into the video, I want to thank you so much for watching the BMW 37-11 Final Drive Assembly. If you found this video helpful or informative in any way, please hit that like button down below, share this video with others, and subscribe if you haven't already, because I will be sharing more detailed videos like this in the near future, and that might be something you're interested in. But for now, I'll get back to work, and I hope to see you in the next one.